Hey everyone, Cody from Mac Telecom Networks. I've realized I've never done a full setup video of Unify Protect. I've done a lot of videos about Unify Protect and their cameras, but never a full setup from start to finish. So that's what we're gonna do in this video besides physically mounting the cameras as my cameras are already mounted. This will be a longer video, so you could skip ahead to different chapters if you'd like. If you're new here, please hit the subscribe button. Make sure to hit the bell icon. If you'd like to hire me for network consulting or Unify Protect Consulting, visit www.mactelecomnetworks.com. You'd find me on Twitter at MacTelecomN. And if you'd like to support the channel, we now have Ubiquity affiliate links, and I'll post that down in the description below. When starting off with the Unify Protect deployment, we need to decide which console we need to go with. Depending on the amount of cameras that you're going to be using and if you want hard drive redundancy, that will change what you need to buy. So let's go through the consoles that could host Protect. The newest one is the Dream Router. In this Dream Router, it would store your camera files on an SD card. We could have a maximum of two cameras on this Dream Router. There is no hard drive redundancy with it. Next up, we have the UDM Pro and the UDM SE. We could put one physical hard drive into both of these consoles. With the UDM Pro, we could have up to 20 HD cameras. With the UDM SE, we could have up to 20 as well. If you need more than 20 cameras and you want hard drive redundancy, that's when we're going to go to the UNVR or the UNVR Pro. The UMVR and the UMVR Pro, they only host the Protect controller and now the UID controller. With the base model of the UNVR, we could go up to 50 HD cameras. And if we were just doing 4K cameras, we could go up to 15. The UNVR has four drive bays for hard drive redundancy and for more camera storage. The UNVR Pro has seven drive bays and the ethernet ports are on the front of the console. On the UNVR, it's on the back. For HD cameras, we could have 60, and for 4K cameras, we could have 20. And the last console that we could host Unify Protect on is the Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus. This comes installed with a one terabyte hard drive, but you could max it out to five terabytes. And for the Protect, we could have 20 HD cameras, or we could have seven 4K cameras. The next thing to consider when doing a Unify Protect installation is the switch that we're going to go with. The majority of the Ubiquiti cameras are power over Ethernet and the wireless ones, they need to be plugged into a wall outlet. So looking at the G4 Pro 4K camera, we could see that the max power consumption is 12.5 watts. Say we are doing a deployment of 10 of these G4 Pro cameras, we'd be at 125 watts. So looking at their Switch 24 PoE, this switch has 16 PoE ports. But as you could tell, we only have a 95 watt total PoE supply. So when you're plugging these cameras in, some of them aren't going to work because we don't have enough power going to it. So you need to make sure that you plan correctly. Also, if you're planning on deploying the camera G4 PTZ, you need to have a switch that's capable of PoE++. And they only have a few. The one is the Switch Pro 24 PoE. Now that we've looked over some of the consoles that we go with and the requirements, let's start doing the configuration. As you can see, I'm using the UNVR Pro and it's just on my default network. We're going to want to create a new camera network. So I'm going to go over to settings and then I'm going to click on networks. From here, I'm going to create a new network. Now I'm going to give it a network name of cameras. The router is going to be my UDM SE and I'm going to turn off the auto scale function. Now we need to give it a subnet and the subnet that I'm going to go with is 192.168.30.1. And we could see below that the IP range that we could use is 30.6 to 30.254 and I'll press add network. Since I do have the G4 doorbell that will require a Wi-Fi network. So I'm going to go up to Wi-Fi and I'm going to create a new Wi-Fi network. I'm going to put it in the name of Mac Telecom camera and then I'm going to give it a password. Under network, we're going to change this from default down to cameras. And then we're going to add that Wi-Fi network. So we have our two networks created. We need to put the physical port. So my UMVR Pro and all my cameras into the camera network. So if we click on the Unify devices, so down below, we could see some of my cameras. They do have camera names, but I have factory defaulted them all and this should change. Now let's put them into the correct VLAN. So I'm going to click this right side driveway. We would see it's connected to my USW Flex switch. I know all the ports on this switch are cameras, so I'm going to click on port 2, and then we're going to switch the profile to cameras, and then apply the changes, and we'll do the same for port 4. To make it grab an IP quicker, I'm going to port power cycle, 
We also need to do the same thing for the UNVR Pro. So we can see it's on my USW Pro aggregation switch on port 23. I'm going to go down to port 23 and then we're going to switch the profile to cameras. I'm going to give this a name as UNVR and then we're going to apply the changes. So we need to make sure we do that for every camera that we want going to our UNVR Pro. Now we have our cameras and my UNVR moved over to the camera network, we could start getting the UNVR set up. Looking below, we could see it's on 192.168.30.169. I'm going to click on the UNVR Pro, go to settings, and then we're going to use a fixed IP. I'm just going to keep it the same at the 30.169 so that it never changes. This is a DHCP reservation. Now we could open up a new Chrome tab and then go to that IP address. And this is just the initial setup for any Unify Protect installation. We see UI is committed to protecting your privacy and security, and then we'll set up the UNVR Pro. Now we need to give this UNVR a console name. I'm going to call it Mac Telecom UNVR. We're going to agree to the terms and service and then press next. Step two, we need to sign into our single sign-on. If we are at a far enough firmware update though, we can skip this and use local credentials. I'm gonna sign in with my single sign-on. Next, we have an update schedule. So this would keep our UNVR up to date. Usually I disable this in my network controllers, access and talk. Before my cameras, I'm gonna leave it on as this is for my house. If this was for a business, I would turn the updates off and push them out manually. Step four is to send diagnostics. We're gonna leave that unchecked. And now we can see it's setting up our console. Now we're at my UNVR console dashboard and we can see that I'm running 2.4.8 for the firmware version of my UNVR. This is new, it was released about four days ago. We have a topology which nothing is showing up yet because I don't have any of the cameras adopted. Same with this new floor plan, once I do have my cameras adopted it will show up here and we'll go over that in a little while. We have notifications and we have our settings wheel. Now let's go through everything that's listed on the side. So we have our updates and our Unify OS version is 2.4.8 and we can see that it's up to date. Our Unify Protect is 1.21.5 and we can see that there's an update available. I'm going to update the Unify Protect controller. Also new on the UNVRs, we have UID. I'm just going to leave that disabled. Below that, we have our Unify OS release channel and I recommend you always leaving it on official. And then we have our updates if we want to do it automatically or if we want to manually push it out. Now under system, we have remote access and remote access by default is turned on. If you want to use the Unify Protect application on your iPhone or your Android, you must have remote access turned on. If you turn this off and you try to VPN in and use the Unify Protect controller, it still won't work. But with the VPN, you can log in through a laptop into your UNVR by the IP address. We have our console name, and then we have this new cloud config backup. So we have automatic cloud config backups, and this will push out to our UI account. We'd see that there's no config backups yet because this is a fresh install. We could create a new config backup, and we could download a config backup and that will download locally to our machine. We have a time zone and then we have a bunch of different console controls for us to restart the console, turn off the console, we could factory default the console and we could transfer ownership. So if you do this as a business and you set it up, you transfer the ownership to your client. We could also turn on SSH if we need to SSH into our UNVR or whatever you're using for Protect. Now we have our notifications. We have Unify OS notifications and then we have our Protect notifications. We need to do the Protect notifications inside of Protect and we'll go over that once we get the cameras adopted. Now depending what you're using for your Unify Protect console, you'll have to choose the drive redundancy. We could see that I have seven hard drives in this UNVR Pro. We could also see that all the drives are healthy as it's showing the green symbol. It is currently initializing as I did do a factory default and it's going to take about four and a half hours. We could see under utilization that I have roughly 12 terabytes of usable space. And then we have a redundancy level. So I'm just going to do a one disk, but you could also do half the disk. We could enable a hot spare and we could reformat the HDDs. Under the about this console, it's going to tell us our console name. It will tell us the model, the local IP, the status, the uptime, memory, and then the compliance, as well as the owner and the Unify OS version. It's also going to show us our performance, so our CPU load, our memory load, and our CPU temperature. Now the Protect application is up to date. Let's go into it and adopt our cameras. If we click on the Unify devices in the left hand pane, we could see our cameras that are ready to be adopted. So I'm just going to go down and I'm going to press on our cameras. 
and then I'm going to click the pending adoption. And this will adopt all of the cameras into our UNVR. And now our cameras are all adopted into our controller. We could see right from this dashboard that we have seven cameras and it's showing my AI360 down to my G4 Pro. At the top, we could see a couple different thumbnails. There's not a whole lot here as it just started recording. But if you could see this little symbol that looks like a fastball, that means it was a motion detection. If you see one that looks like a car, that means it was a smart vehicle detection. And if you see one that looks like a person, it's a smart person detection. We probably won't get much of that today because it is raining outside. But we could click on any one of these thumbnails and it will pull up some of the video footage of what it detected. So let's pull up the smart vehicle detection. And there's a few things right off the top. We could see it's on my G4 Pro and we could see the time. Also, we have this where it highlights the smart detections. We could change the playback speed. I'm going to leave it at one times. We could unmute the sound and then we could change the quality. It just does automatic. I'm going to change it to 4K. We could also take a snapshot and then we could enter full screen or we could download this event. Let's take a look at the event. You can see that it puts a red box around the vehicle for the smart vehicle detection and it would do the same thing if it detected a person. Now we can see a few more things right from this dashboard. We can see the storage utilization. We have six cameras that are recording in 1080p and then we have one on 4K. We could tell that most of the recording done so far has been continuous. We also have time lapse and then detections. And we could also see who has accessed this UMBR. I'm signed in with my account, but we can see that I've accessed it from my iOS phone. Now let's take a look at a couple of the settings on the camera. We're just gonna do this on my G4 Pro. If you want a full review on cameras, I do have separate videos based on that. But on the overview, it just tells you the standard stuff, the firmware version, the MAC address, and the IP, and the frame rate. Under recording, the recording default mode is to have always on. So this is recording 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's how I like it. But you could have it set to never or you could have it detections only. We could also set up recording schedules. Right here you would click configure recording schedule. I don't do that as I have it on for 24 seven. And then we have our recording quality. So we have this high frame rate mode. If we turn high frame rate mode on, it will bump up our frames per second. If I do that on the G4 Pro, it will stop recording in 4K. So I'll leave that off, but I'll show you on one of my G4 bullets. We'll go to recording and then recording quality. And it's currently recording at 24 frames per second. If I turn this on, it will go to 48 frames per second. Having these both maxed out and on high frame rate mode will use up more storage space, but I like to have the best quality I can. Now we have our motion detection settings. So seconds of motion needed to trigger detection before and then after. And then we have our smart detection. This is where we could turn on the person detection and the vehicle detection. We have our motion zone, so we could edit the motion zone. By default, it's the whole camera lens, but we could change this to just do our driveway. Now for any motion event, it will only pick up on my driveway and not anybody else's. We also have the same thing for smart detection zone. So it has both selected. We have our person and we have our vehicle and it's gonna take up the whole zone. But say we didn't care about the people walking on the sidewalk and just on our driveway and on our property, we could drag and drop these corners down. And now for the smart person zone, it's just on my driveway and my front lawn. We could also add a new zone. For this new zone, I'm gonna have just vehicles selected and I'm just gonna cover the roadway. And now the roadway is covered and we can see that I have a delivery, which is great timing. Depending on your state or your province, you might have to have privacy zones where you can't record any of your neighbor's lawn or any other property. In that case, we would add this privacy zone. So now let's add a privacy zone to only show my property. I'm gonna add a new zone. And then we're going to just pull and drag up to everywhere except my property. Now with the privacy zone set, everything is blocked off besides my property. So you need to follow your local state or province laws. For me, I could have everything recording, so I'm going to delete this. Next up, we have some settings so we could give our G4 Pro a name. I'm going to call this right side of the driveway. And then we have our microphone sensitivity. Again, depending on your state laws, you might have to disable this microphone. And to do that, you could disable permanently. If you do disable it permanently though, you will not be able to re-enable the microphone unless you factory default it. 
For the G4 Pro, it has a status light, so it does a blue LED ring around it when it detects motion, so you could turn that on or off. And then we have our overlay information, so it will show the time, the camera name, the Ubiquiti logo, or the bitrate. We could also restart the camera, and then if we wanted to look at some RTSP streams, we could do that as well and we could unmanage the camera from the console completely. A couple more things about the cameras before we move on is let's take a look at our Wi-Fi cameras. So we have my G4 doorbell. If we go to our settings and we wanna switch this to a different wireless network, we could do it right from this interface. We could see the Wi-Fi connection and it's on my Mac Telecom camera, but we can switch the SSID right from Protect. We could also pull up this adjust camera picture and it's gonna give us a whole bunch of different options including infrared, orientation, the brightness, contrast hue, so on and so forth. Next, let's take a look at our live view. So this is the default live view that Protect has given me. At the top, we have my AI360 and it's covered in rain. This is just a test camera. Usually I wouldn't have it in my backyard like this, but we can change these views. We'd see on the right hand side that it says select view. This is just default, but we could add a new live view. I'm going to call this YouTube one. What it's showing on screen right now is we could put four cameras on, but I have more cameras than that. So we'll click on this grid and then on the grid type, it says four cameras, but I'm going to select seven because that's as many as I have. Now, all we need to do to add the cameras to this view is drag and drop it. So I'm going to start in the top left from my driveway over. So we'll start with my G4 bullet and then we'll go with my G4 pro. We'll do my doorbell camera and then I'll do the side of my house. We'll do the backyard AI 360. We'll do the backyard G4 bullet and then we'll do my garage camera and then I'll press save. Now we have the live view set up how we want and you can make multiple different views. If you have the unified viewports, you could set up multiple views for that as well. Now let's take a look at the playback. This is my G4 doorbell and we can see that it's currently on the live view but we could drag this and scroll through footage that was recorded. We could also see under the timeline when there was a smart person detection or there was a vehicle detection or motion, and we could click on this detection. Here it will show us the detection events and we could click on that and it will bring us back to that event. And for this, it was just a car going by. The next tab we have is our detections and we could do different display options. Under our display options, we could have all detection types or we could just select what we want. We could have ring, which would ring my doorbell or we could have person and vehicle. And the next thing we have is this analytics tab, which won't show a lot as this hasn't been running too long. But let's take a look at one of my front cameras. From this view, we could see a little heat map and this is where most people have traveled on. And at the bottom, we could see it was one person between 8.50 and 8.55 a.m. If we switch to our vehicles, it's going to show us the same thing. We could see the heat map of where the vehicles were going and at what time and how many vehicles. Now let's look at our settings. Under general, we have update protect. We have our temperature unit, so in Fahrenheit or Celsius. And then we have our time representation. Either we could do it 12 hours or 24. We also have this camera password. So what this camera password is, if we need to SSH into the camera, we would use this. Or if you need to move it to another console, that's the password you would need. We have geofencing and then we have our smart detection. So you could either disable these or enable them. We had factory reset protect and then we could do our configuration backups. Here's where we'd set our protect notifications. We have it on default. So default notifications are enabled. You will only be notified of important events such as a doorbell ring. You can customize your notifications if you'd like. I'm just going to leave mine on the default. And then we have our video retention. So we have time-based recording deletions. If we turn that on, you could specify how many days you want to hit. So if you put it to 15, after 15 days, it will delete that footage. I don't turn this on myself, but some people do. And then below that, that's where we would add our recording schedules. And that's going to be it for this full Unify Protect setup video. There was a lot to go through and I will do other Unify Protect videos when updates come out. If you have any questions about this video, please leave it in the comments below. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button. If you're new here, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. All right, thanks.